Chapter 3 Long years after all this, two elderly men were talking together in a club smoking room. They had the place almost to themselves. Most of the members, having lunched and taken their coffee and cigarettes, had strolled away. There was a small knot of men with their heads close together over the table, chuckling and relating and hearing juicy gossip. Two or three others were dotted about the solemn, funebrous room, each apart with his paper, deep in his armchair. Our two were in a retired corner, which might have been called snug in any other place. They were old friends, it appeared, and one, the less elderly, had returned not long before from some far place, after an absence of many years. "'I haven't seen anything of Harry Morgan since I've been home.' he remarked. I suppose he's still in town. Still in Beresford Street, but he doesn't get out so much now. He's getting a bit stiff in the joints, a good ten years older than I am. I should like to see him again. I always thought him a very good fellow. A first-rate fellow. You know that story about Bartle Frere. Man was sent to meet him at the station and asked how he should know him. They told him to look out for an old gentleman with grey whiskers helping somebody, and he found Frere helping an old woman with a big basket out of a third-class carriage. Harry Morgan was like that, except for the whiskers. There was a pause, and then the man who had retold the old Sir Bartle Frere story began again. I don't suppose you ever heard the kindest thing Morgan ever did, one of the kindest things I've ever heard of. You know I come from his part of the country. My people used to have Pras Hanok, only a few miles from Hrantresant Abbey, the Morgan's place. My father told me all about it, but I don't think many people got to hear of it. Harry kept the thing very dark. Upon my word, what is it about a man not letting his left hand know what his right hand is about? Morgan has lived up to that if any man ever did. Well, it was like this. Have you ever heard of old Tylo Morgan? He was a bit before our day. Not an old man, by the way. I don't suppose he was much over forty when he died. Well, he went the pace in the old style. He was very well known in town, not in society, or rather, in damned bad society, and not far from here either. They had a picture of him in some low print of the time, with those long whiskers that used to be worn then. They didn't give his name, just called it the Hero of the Haymarket. You wouldn't believe it, would you? But in those days, the Haymarket was the great place for night houses, Kate Hamilton and all that lot. Morgan was in the thick of it all, but that picture annoyed him. He had those whiskers of his cut off at Truffitt's the very next day. He was the sort of man they got the silver dinner service out for when he entertained his friends at Cremorne, and judge and jury, and the Post Plastique, and that place in Windmill Street where they fought without the gloves, and all the rest of it. And it was just as bad down in the country. He used to take his London friends, male and female, down there, and led the sort of life he lived in town, as near as he could make it. They used to tell a story, true very likely, of how he and a half-dozen rapscallions like himself were putting away the port after dinner, and making a devil of a noise, all talking and shouting and cursing at the top of their voices, when Tylo seemed to pull himself together and get very grave all in a minute. "'Silence, gentlemen!' he called out. The rest of them took no notice. One of them started a blackguard song, and the others got ready to join in the chorus. "'Hold your damn tongues, damn you!' Morgan bawled at them, and smashed a big decanter on the table. "'Do you think,' he said, "'that that's the sort of thing for youngsters to listen to?' Have you no sense of decency? Didn't I tell you that the children were coming down to dessert? With that, he rang a bell that was by him on the table, and, so the story goes, six young fellows and six young girls came trooping down the big staircase, without a single stitch on them, calling out in squeaky voices, Oh, dear Papa, what have you done to dear Mamma? and the rest of it. The phrase was evidently an inclusive, vague, but altogether damnatory clause with this teller of old tales. Well, he continued, you can imagine what the county folk 
thought of all that sort of thing. Tylo Morgan made L'Entresant Abbey stink in their nostrils. Naturally, none of them would go near the place. The women, who were, perhaps, rather more particular about such matters than they are now, simply wouldn't have Morgan's name mentioned in their presence. The Duke cut him dead in the street. His subscription to the hunt was returned. I don't think he cared. You know garden parties were beginning to get fashionable then, and they say Morgan sent out engraved invitations, with a picture of a nymph and a satyr on them that some artist fellow had done for him. Not a nice picture at all, according to county standards. And what do you think he had at the bottom of the card instead of RSVP? No clothes by request. He was a damned impudent fellow, if you like. I believe the party came off all right, with more friends from town, and most unusual games and sports on the lawn and in the shrubberies. It was said that Treowen, the duke's son, was there, but he always swore, through thick and thin, that it was a lie. But it was brought up against him afterwards, when he stood with Herbert for the county. And what do you think happened next? A most extraordinary thing. Nobody was prepared for it. Everyone said he would just drink and devil and wench himself to death, and a damned good riddance. Well, I'll tell you. There was one thing, you know, that everybody had to confess. In his very worst days, Tyler Morgan always left the country girls alone. Never interfered with the farmer's daughters or cottage girls or anything in that way. And then, one fine day, when he was up with a keeper, looking after a few head of grouse he had on the mountain, what should he do but fall in love with the girl of fifteen, who lived with her mother or grandmother, I don't know which, in a cottage right up there. Mary Trevor, I believe her name was. My father had seen her once or twice, afterwards, driving with Morgan in his tandem. He said she was a most beautiful creature, a perfectly lovely woman. She was a type that you see sometimes in Wales. Very dark, black eyes, black hair, oval face, skin a pale olive. Not at all unlike those girls that used to prance up and down Arles in southern France, and with their hair done up in velvet ribbons. I don't know whether you've ever been there. There's something oriental about that style of beauty. It doesn't last long. Anyhow, Tylo Morgan fell flat on the spot. He went straight down to the abbey and packed the whole company up back to town, told them they could go to hell, or bloody Jerusalem, or the Haymarket, for all he cared. As soon as they'd all gone, he went off to the mountain again. He wasn't seen at the abbey for weeks. I'm sure I don't know why he didn't marry the girl straight away. Nobody knew. She said that he did marry her, but we shall come to that presently. In due course, the baby came along, and Morgan wanted to pension off the old lady and take the mother and child down to Hlantresant. But the doctors advised against it. I believe Morgan got some very good men down, and they were all inclined to shake their heads over the child. I don't think they committed themselves or named any distinct disease or anything of that kind. But they were all agreed that there was a certain delicacy of constitution, that the boy would have a much better chance if they kept him up in the mountain air for the first few years of his life. Hantresant Abbey, I should tell you, is right down in the valley by the river, with woods and hills all around it. Fine place, but rather damp and relaxing, I dare say. So the long and short of it was that young Tylo stayed up with his mother and the old woman, and old Tylo used to come and see them for weekends, as they say now, till the boy was four or five years old, and then the old lady was looked after somewhere or other, and the mother and son went to live at the abbey. Everything went on all right, except that the county people kept away, for three or four years. The child seemed well and strong, and the tutor they got in for him said he was a tremendous fellow with his books, well in advance of his age, unusually interested in his work and all that. Then he got ill very ill indeed. I don't know what it was. Some brain trouble, I should think. Meningitis, or something of that sort. It was touch and go for weeks, and it left the unfortunate little chap an absolute wreck at the end of it. For a long time, they thought he was paralyzed. All the strength had gone out of his limbs. And the worst of it was, his mind was affected. He seemed bright enough, mind you. Nothing dull or heavy about him. 
and I'm told you might listen to him chattering away for half an hour on end, and go away thinking he was a perfect phenomenon of a child for intelligence. But if you listened long enough, you'd hear something that would pull you up with a jerk. Crazy? Yes, and worse than crazy. Mixed up in a way with a kind of sense, so that you might begin to wonder which was queer, yourself or the boy. It was a dreadful grief to the parents, especially to his father. He used to talk about his sins, finding him out. I don't know. There may have been something in that. Whips to scourge us. Perhaps so. They got the tutor back after some time. The child begged so hard for him that they were afraid he'd worry himself into another brain fever if they didn't give way. So he came along with instructions to make the lessons as much a farce as he liked, and the more the better, not, on any account, to press the boy over his work. And from what my father told me, young Tylo nearly drove the poor man off his head. He was far sharper in a way than he'd ever been before, with a memory like Macaulay's, once read, never forgotten, and an amazing appetite for learning. But then the twist in the brain would come out. Mathematics, brilliant. And at the end of the lesson, he's frightened that tutor of his with a new theory of figures, some notion of the figures that we don't know of, the numbers that are between the others, something rather more than one, but less than two, and so forth. It was the same with everything. There was that secret conquest of England a hundred years ago that nobody was allowed to mention, and the squares that were always changing their shape and geometry, and the great continent that was hidden because Africa was on top of it, so that you couldn't see it. Then, when it came to the classics, there were fresh cases for the nouns, and new moods for the verbs, and all the rest of it. Most extraordinary, and very sad for his father and mother. The poor little fellow took a tremendous interest in the family history and in the property, but I believe he hashed all that up in some infernal way. Well, it seemed there was nothing to be done. Then his father died. Of course, the question of the succession came up at once. Poor Mrs. Morgan, as she called herself to the last, swore she was married to Tylo, but she couldn't produce any papers, any papers that were evidence of a legal marriage, anyhow. I fancy the truth was that they were married in some forgotten little chapel up in the mountains by a hedge preacher or somebody of that kind, who didn't know enough to get in the registrar. Of course, Tylo ought to have known better, but probably he didn't bother at the time, so long as he satisfied the girl. He may have meant to make it all right eventually, and left it too late. I don't know. Anyhow, Payne Llewellyn, the family solicitor, gave the poor woman to understand that she and the boy would have to leave Hantrasant Abbey, and off they went. They had one room in a miserable back street in Islington or Barnsbury or some such godforsaken place, and she earned a bare living in a sweater's workshop. Meanwhile, the property had passed to a cousin, Harry Morgan, and he hadn't been heard of, or barely heard of, for some years. He had gone off exploring Central Asia, or the sources of the Amazon, when Tylo Morgan was in his glory, if you can put it that way. He hadn't heard a word of Tylo's reformation or of Mary Trevor and her boy, and when old Llewellyn was able to get at him after considerable difficulty and delays, he never mentioned the woman or her son. When Morgan did come home at last, he found he didn't fancy the old family place, called it a dismal hole, I believe. Anyhow, he let it on a longish lease to a mental specialist, mad doctors they called them then, and he turned the abbey into a lunatic asylum. Then somebody told Harry about Mary Trevor and the poor child, and the marriage or no marriage. He was furious with Llewellyn. He had a search made, and when he found them, it was just too late so far as Mary Trevor was concerned. She had died of grief and hard work and semi-starvation, no doubt. But Harry took the boy away, and finding how he was longing to go back to the abbey, he was quite convinced, you see, that he was the owner of it, and of all the Morgan estates, Harry got the doctor who was running the place to take Tylo as a patient. He was given a set of rooms to himself in a wing right away from the other patients. Everything was done to encourage him in his notion that he was Tylo Morgan of Rantrasant Abbey. Going back to the old place had stirred up all his enthusiasm for the family, and the property, 
on the management of the estates, and it became the great interest of his life. He quite thought he was making it the best managed estate in the county, inaugurating a new era in English farming and all the rest of it. Harry Morgan instructed Captain Vaughan, the estate agent, to see Tylo once a week and enter into all his schemes and pretend to carry them out. And I believe Vaughan played up extremely well, though he sometimes found it difficult to keep a straight face. You see, that twist in the brain wasn't getting any better, and when it went to work on practical farming, it produced some amazing results. Vaughan would be told to get this bit of land ready for pineapples, and somewhere else they were to grow olives. And what about zebras for haulage? but it kept him happy to the last. Do you know, the very day he died, he wrote a long letter of instructions to Vaughn. What do you think it was about? You won't guess. He told Vaughn to plant the tree of life in a potato patch by the sore, and gave full cultural directions. God bless me, you don't say so. The major, who had listened to the long story, ruminated a while. He had been brought up in an old-fashioned evangelical household, and had always loved revelations. The text burned and glowed into his memory, and he said in a strong voice, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. There was only one man besides our two friends left in the darkening room, and he had fallen fast asleep in his armchair, with his paper on the ground before him. The Major's clear intonation woke him with a crash, and when he heard the words that were being uttered, he was seized with unspeakable and panic terror, and ran out of the room, howling, more or less, for the committee. But the Major, having ended his text, said, I always thought Harry Morgan was a good fellow, but I didn't know he was such a thundering good fellow as that. And that was his Amen.